Hello, True Health Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. I have an amazing episode for you today. We have a doctor who is a PhD a professor. He has created entire programs for universities. He is a doctor of several types of medicine, chiropractic, naturopathy, osteopathy, traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, herbalism, the list goes on and on. He's been practicing as a doctor for 50 years and he has developed a type of a system that empowers you in the most amazing way. I absolutely love it. This interview was two and a half hours long. It could have gone longer, <laughs> in fact. So I split it up into two parts. So today is part one. You will definitely want to listen to both parts uh, as he has some amazing stories to share. Uh, And we're going to have him back on the show too because he wants to dive into quantum physics and healing uh, and what those two things have in common. So that'll be the next time we have him on the show. We will dive deeper into that topic. So you're really going to enjoy today's episode and part two as well, which I will publish shortly after this one. I have an exciting surprise for you. I am launching a workshop in January. It's going to be a live workshop done on webinar. So anyone from around the world can participate. It'll be a live workshop and there'll be four webinars. So it'll it'll be each week in January that we will get together. The workshop is your New Year's health transformation. Our focus is going to be on creating these health habits that really make a huge difference. And in fact, by doing my training, you will at the end of the training have more mental clarity, better sleep, more energy, and more joy and vibrance in your life. So if you're ready to set up your 2019 right, if you want to launch into 2019 and have your January set you up for all of 2019 to have more mental clarity and have amazing energy and vitality, and just transform your health habits, then definitely jump on board. Go to learntruehealth.com slash yes. I'm making this accessible and affordable for everyone. It is $37. It's going to be a limited space. You're going to want to go now and sign up. Learntruehealth.com slash yes. We'll get you there. Sign up and reserve your spot to join us in our New Year's Health Transformation Workshop. You're absolutely going to love it. Anyone from around the world can do these health habits that are designed to support you in achieving your health goals. These are key health habits that bring you the most joy and the most results and help your body come back into balance. If you've caught yourself thinking about the confusion, the frustration that you have around what steps you should take to gain better health. If you've been listening to all these health podcasts and you're really like not clear on where to start or what steps would be best for you, then this course is absolutely where you're going to want to do. By the end of the course, you will have clarity on the actionable steps that are right for you to take in your life to transform your health in 2019. So jump on board, join my course. I'm really excited to work with you. It's going to be a ton of fun. The key is we're going to have a lot of fun transforming our life into a life that brings us joy, vibrance and better health for 2019. So go to learntruehealth.com slash yes and join us. It's going to be so much fun. I can't wait to see you there. Learntruehealth.com slash yes and enjoy today's interview. Welcome to the Learn True Health podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 313. I am so excited for our next guest. We have with us the founder of Body Talk System. John Feltheim is an amazing healer and doctor. His bio is so long, I could not possibly uh, tell it (laughs) in the span of the two hour interview. (laughs) John, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show today. Um, I want to say about a year ago, I had one of your practitioners on the show and she that was episode uh, 282 Lynn Del Mastro Thompson it was a fantastic interview and she talked about the body talk system and I asked her a few questions and she goes you know I, I don't know the answer to that I think I asked her like how does it work and how did you know how did how how was it invented and 
And she said, you're going to have to have the founder on the show. And I thought, that's a brilliant idea. Let's get John on the show. And I was so thrilled that you decided to jump on and share with our listeners your amazing system. About 20% of our listeners, um, twenty between 20 and 25% of our listeners are... Um, are, are in the holistic health field. So we have listeners that are naturopaths and chiropractors, and acupuncturists and nurses and um, health coaches and massage therapists. And I know that they would be very interested to learn about your system to add that as their tool, to use those tools in their tool belt for their clients, but also for all the listeners who are gain, looking to gain their health back, who have these unanswerable questions. What should I eat? How do I get healthy? I'm, I'm suffering from these symptoms and nothing's working and these drugs are just managing symptoms and I really want to figure out what my body needs. And uh, they go to all these experts and it just, everything helps a little but doesn't really help completely and they don't feel like they have the full picture. And I feel that, John, you have deciphered a system that gives us the full picture. So I'm very excited to dive into that today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, um, I've heard about you for quite a while, so I've been looking forward to this. Awesome. Well, I'd love for you to start by sharing your story. What happened in your life as you were going through your, <laughs> your wonderful career of, as a healer that ha had you discover the body and, and create the body talk system? Mm -hmm. I've got I had two biographers trying to get me to t explore my life and tell it and I said, you're going to have to wait until I'm nearly dead and then publish it after I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, now I've always been interested in um, searching for life and interested in life. And I started very early. I, I was doing Zen meditation when I was uh, seven and went on to other meditations, eventually TM for many, many years. And... Um, I studied martial arts and I got into that in a, in a fairly big way uh, from again when I was about seven or eight and, until I went to college in at Melbourne and through the, the martial arts getting an appreciation of the energy systems of the body, the way we move and things like that. Sorry, I'm flapping my hand and hitting my mic. I'll stop that doing that. <laughs> and um, I had a probably my first major interest was in philosophy and in particular Indian philosophy, which in Australia in those days was very difficult, but uh, the best bookstore was in England, in London, I forget the name of the, the store, but it's the store for that type of thing. And my poor mother had to keep writing over there for books that I wanted, you know, 14 lessons on yoga philosophy, which is 14 books, etc. But I just continued to devour them and then become very interested in uh, comparative religion, all that type of thing. So in the meantime, when I, um, if, with my martial arts, I must admit that doctors weren't helping me much when it come to injuries, et cetera. And I found alternative therapies like osteopathy, chiropractic, acupuncture helped me a great deal more. So that sort of enticed me to go into that field rather than the straight medical field. And um, so I started out doing chiropractic in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, graduated there, become very active with that in the association because we got it completely recognized by the government and licensed and I was incremental of that because I was the academic chairman for many years. And um, from there I went into acupuncture. I found that we could do that and I studied that and kept studying it and then decided we needed to teach it. So I formed a college that's now the, I think the second largest acupuncture college in the world at the moment. But uh, even when I was there, I wrote, rewrote the curriculum as a four-year full-time curriculum and I did a lot of work with sports medicine and with that as well. It sort of never stopped from then on. I did naturopathy and nutrition and uh, osteopathy and so on. I had to practice. Um, you know, I thought if I practiced enough I'll get pretty perfect. <laughs> um, but uh, the practice was always a bit of a problem for me because uh, I've always been, you know, successful and I've had a nice setup. And uh, one of the big problems when you've got a very busy clinic is that uh, it's very hard to maintain it in so much as uh, you get waiting lists, you know, people wanting to see you once you get a good name. And although I was, ex you know, I was extremely busy, my clinic setup is 10 treatment rooms and 10 assistants in each room. Now a combination of 
therapists, massage therapists, physical therapists, etc. And then there were patients in every room, and my job was to go in, check them out, decide what needs to be done, you know, acupuncture here, chiro chiropractic here, etc. And then I'd give instructions, and except when they needed the needles put in or adjustments, I wasn't there. I had my staff look after them. So the patients were there for a while, and they looked after very well. But it was busy. I was averaging 20 patients an hour. And when you work where you see, literally yourself see 20 patients an hour for eight to 10 hours a day, that uh, can be a little bit exhausting, but it was good for me because I get bored if I do any less than that. And uh, then I continue to study. I, in the evenings when I finished, I went to the college and I lectured four nights a week, three hours a night at the college. And uh, then I was involved in all the associations. I was president of most of them and sort of uh, was implemented on getting chiropractic registered by the government and so on. So my life has always been around healthcare. And uh, the college that I developed, uh, I was principal of for many years, I wrote their curriculum. It's still going. It's now a university course, fully recognized by the government, uh, same as chiropractic is. It's a six year full time university course. And um, interesting enough, my system, Body Talk in Australia, is also recognized by the federal health department and government. So our practitioners, when they get our basic qualifications, can practice with health benefits and all that type of thing which is really cool. It was, uh, considering I'm Australian, it was the first country to do that. And I wasn't even involved with it. It was some of my students over there who actually got that all rolling and got that done. And um, so, and we're getting recognition, you know, a lot because of the profile. As far as beyond that, I um, was very, have always studied primarily philosophy, particularly Indian Advaita Vedanta philosophy. I also, of course, did Taoism to a great extent, and I, I did a PhD in um, the Toronto University in um, ancient Chinese medical philosophy, and it was a book written 2,000 years ago called The Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine. I did a thesis uh, by doing a, uh, basically comparing what they knew then to what we knew now, and actually showing oh, they knew, cool. in many cases, they knew a lot more about the physiology of the body then than they did now, <laughs> 2,000 years ago. And uh, I wrote all that up. So I've always been involved academically. Other than that, when I was uh, competing, I developed what we call Mindscape. Mindscape is widely practiced. Um, I was one of the originals. But there's now many names for it, but it's taught in, I taught it in the Australian Institute of Sport, but it's all over the world. And that is where you train the mind, the, the, the right brain to do things up, up sort of in a workshop. So you've got right brain uh, information in a left brain intellect. And uh, it enables you to do a lot of the things like sports people preparing for a sport or studying or learning, or just the ability of diagnosing and working what's going on with a person. So when people graduate from that, I expect them, you know, we to in order to develop your medical intuition, basically Mindscape develops medical intuition. And that is useful. You need to be good at it. You need to be able to verify it. And um, the way I proved I was good at it is back in, uh, when I first started, back in the 70s, when MRIs weren't available, uh, neurosurgeons had a lot of trouble with um, diagnosis of tumors. Because if the hard tumor was fine, x-rays could show it. But if they're soft tumors, they didn't have MRIs and that, you know, and it was very hard to discern. And they had to go by symptoms primarily. But the trouble is the symptoms didn't tell them exactly where the tumor was. It would tell them approximately. So in those days, uh, operations like that were dangerous, you know, not to be taken lightly. But I had six neurologists who used to send their cases to me. And I'd use Mindscape to different to be able to tell them exactly where the tumor is, what size it is, and its you know, exact location, and even what type. And I'd write it all down, send them back, and they'd operate based on that. So this is life or death stuff. But they knew, they trusted the fact that I was always right, and which I was. And it saved a lot of lives like that and made them happy. I did that for a fair while, but when I decided to give up practice and move, I managed to train a few of them, and they've continued the process. It's happening a lot more. The, the Mindscape is is developing the intuition in a way that it is totally reliable and can be used in any part, aspect of your life. So that's one of the programs that I have instructors teaching throughout the world. 
but I originally developed it actually in the medical field, but also in my martial arts, because it enabled me to have insights about the guy I was competing against, and I could tell what he was going to do in the next couple of seconds, long before he did, which uh, meant I was undefeated for some 15 <laughs> years in martial arts. So beyond that, it's continued on. And uh, what really got me going in, uh, in body talk was a personal thing. I had worked for like 16 years, um, six days a week. I never took a single tie day off. And I had the biggest practice in Australia by far and lecturing and um, it, my health caught up with me. And uh, I ended up um, suddenly collapsing and uh, taken to hospital. And they did the scan on me and uh, I had apparently had Epstein-Barr and brucellosis virus. And brucellosis is a cow virus, but I'd been helping my uncle who's a farmer deliver a breech presentation cow. And I delivered it, but I didn't have gloves on and I had cuts in my hands. So I got the cow virus into me which is not good, especially combined with Epstein-Barr. In fact, it's deadly. So at the hospital, they came back and said, well, we've scanned you. You've um, only got 10% of your liver left. Your liver enzyme count is 1,600, where it should be about 50. Wow. And I said, oh, yeah, what are you going to do? And they said, we're going, you're going to be dead in three days, so we're just going to sedate you to make sure you're comfortable. So when you're given three days to live, you lie there and think, uh, well, maybe I should look at changing my lifestyle. <laughs> 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 and actually, at first, it was great news to me because of my philosophy and everything. I was really wanted, I was quite happy to die because then I got to prove if my philosophies were right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at first, I was enthusiastic about the whole idea. And then I realized I had kids, four, you know, four fairly young kids, and I thought, no, nah, they still need me. So I checked myself out of hospital. And proceeded to treat myself with uh, Chinese herbs, acupuncture, and meditation primarily. And um, I got better to the point that a month later, or two months later, I went in, and my liver was back to normal size, and my liver enzyme count was back down to about 55. Doctors couldn't believe it. They took the x-rays twice and um, decided they made a mistake in the first <laughs> situation. Yeah, right. and, um, but I was never right. I continue to have a chronic, the chronic Epstein bar and brucellosis that, although I was functional, I always had a temperature and always had aches and pains. So I set out, I quit my practice and I met my, the woman I was to marry, uh, my second marriage, uh, who was a brilliant woman, a linguist who's traveled all over the world and also had a degree in natural therapies, etc. And we set off around the world teaching Mindscape and a couple other things that courses that she had developed while I looked for a cure and um, I was trying everything I was going and sitting in ice water up in you know northern Europe for hours at a time <laughs> you and virtually everything because I was an encyclopedia of the different therapies but nothing was really helping until I um, got an idea uh, it was a mixture of different things but I got an idea that I needed a representation so I took a little bit of blood out of my finger and I put it on my navel, which is a center of energy. And uh, then I started activating the brain by tapping it to get it to be active in looking at what's going on, you know. And I got a reaction. And in fact, I spent the next three days in bed with a temperature of about 104. Yet it was a good temperature. You know, I felt it was doing good. And the, the, the saying I use is that on the third day, I arose. <laughs> 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 because it was exactly after three days, I got better. And I was a different person. And um, I felt incredible. And I decided, well, this needs to be shared with other people. Because uh, Epstein-Barr, brucellosis is unusual, but Epstein-Barr, Lyme disease, all those are very important. And with quickly testing with a lot of people I knew, I found that most viruses responded to the, the aspect of the treatment I did. And then I found it had many, many more connotations. So I started working on it in the early 90s. And by 95, I had a program that I decided I could teach. It was a, just a weekend program, basic, but I taught it in Europe uh, with very good results. And it just kept expanding from there. And then I started analyzing it for, and I used my, you know, my main influence in life has always been dynamic systems theory and Christoph Capra, you know, his work, the Tao of physics and 
uncommon wisdom, etc. And uh, and being a systems theorist, which you have to be if you're in natural therapy, because you know systems theory is the basis of acupuncture and a whole lot of different things. That is basically saying everything relates to everything else, right? There's no two parts of the body that are completely independent. They're all connected. And they're all interrelated in both interreliable. You know, it is a fact, and I've shown it over and over again. You can kick your toe and get a stomach ulcer from it, you know, um, because of the interrelationships of the stomach meridian and a whole lot of other things like that. So, having had that background, which is primarily from traditional acupuncture and uh, my own personal studies of life, I then developed the concept of being able to get a protocol going where we could communicate with the body. Now, you could call that medical intuition, but of course, and I'm a medical intuitive and I've been tested for it, but I know the average pay person isn't, but I developed a system of being able to, you know, talk to the body by biofeedback, question and answer. A lot of people are doing it, you know, muscle testing and so on. I refined it to a, a more accurate system, but basically it's based on getting in touch with the intuition of the patient in your own intuition, and then asking what to do based on a protocol. The protocol is the left brain factor that enables you to focus on what you're doing and focus the right brain. So what we're saying is you don't learn formulas, that we don't have a formula for anything. Because I don't care what disease you walk in, I can have 10 people walking in the same disease, treat them all successfully and not have done anything the same on any of them. Because no treatment. I don't have any formulas for treatments. When a person comes in, I don't care what they are. I start from scratch because I want to find the formula that is exactly right for them. And that's very different to someone else, even though they've got the same label as a disease. And um, which means you are looking at everything. And basically with the protocol, it gradually developed and developed. And it's a big thing there. You need quite a few charts in the wall to <laughs> keep up with it. And um, I was able to introduce it to many different aspects. I brought in the nutrition factors and I brought in the sports medicine factors. Uh, I did a lot of work with the neurology and balancing brain, etc. But I kept it in a way that the other people could understand it. And um, although it is best suited for practitioners already to be able to then refine their practice and refine the principles of body talk to their own stuff. In other words, you can use body talk principles in nutrition in acupuncture all those types of things because you know we know there's no such thing as the good diet because it's a case of a good diet for the, that particular person and uh, I never prescribed diets per se I looked at the person looked at their needs looked at their chemistry looked at their blood group and all those types of things before I even thought about giving them any advice on diet and um, but asking their body could tell me that and so essentially it's a formalized system that follows a protocol that makes sure we cover all the things and it takes a while to do that and um, asking the body because over the many years you know I would see this that the fact of the matter is I've never met a healthy person in my life and because I'm being 50 years in the, the game and considered a very good diagnostician um, when you see a patient I remember when I was supervising a lot of the colleges and I was sort of head chairman of the colleges in Australia. But I used to go around in final years and watch students working, etc. And I could see a, work, a student working on a patient. And within a couple of minutes, I could tell you who was their final year teacher, who's their practical teacher, what college they came from, and what they're going to do next. Because people follow habits and they follow the habits of their teachers, mm -hmm. you know. And that does means that they're def they're following sort of set rules. For example, if they were uh, homeopaths, that homeopathic background, and the person had all sorts of digestive issues, they're going to be looking at the liver the most because homeopaths love cleaning up the liver as a priority. And if they're acupuncturists, they want to do the kidney adrenal complex because that's a very important foundation. And of course, if they're a naturopath, they want to clean out the, the guts, you know, enemas and God knows what to clean it all out. They're coming from a particular approach, whereas for me, it's not. I don't come from any approach. I have a system where I routinely ask the body questions to get answers from it as to where I should go. And um, 
by doing that, you're coming right down because I would have, you know, major sports people with injuries and yet you're, they're not getting a result. Actually, I can give you a, a good example of that because I did do a lot of work with the Australian Institute of Sport. But we had a, a football player played rugby, uh, which is, you know, the top game in the world, of which Australia are the best. <laughs> Canada are about 20th in the world, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this guy was played for Australia and he played a, you know, very key position, very important position, but he kept getting injured. He went to a stage where he just kept getting injured and he kept pulling his hamstring. And he was going to acupuncture and chiropractic and physical therapy and exercise, but he'd think it was good. He'd get back on the field within half a game, he pulled the hamstring again. And when you've got to kick a ball very hard and high, a bad torn hamstring is not a good idea. And um, so he had to stop. And I was looking at having to retire him because this has been going on for months. And uh, anyway, the Institute of Sports sent him up to me. And um, I got talking to him. And uh, it didn't take very long because by asking questions, I realized that, you know, the hamstring is actually controlled by the colon and colon meridian, and it's strongly tied in with the intestinal tract. And the colon is about letting go. You know, you let go of your food, but it's also about letting go of life, releasing, not being anal retentive, in other words, and um, being able to go with the flow. And what mm -hmm. I detected is his colon was quite tender and inflamed. The hamstring was obviously torn. And then just by asking a couple more questions, I finally asked him, is your father alive? And he looked at me, he sort of briskly says, yes. And uh, we, we put it all down. His problem was he was a very religious guy, very straight guy, and he was Italian. But what he had found out not that long ago was that his father, who was in Australia now, used to be a member of the, the mafia. And in fact, one of the m members who took care of problems, as you could call it. And when he found that out, he had a violent fight with his father and swear he would never talk to him again. Mm. And it was within two weeks of that that he tore his hamstring the first time. Because as he said to his father, I will never forgive you. I'll never let go of this. Never forgive you. And of course, that ongoing stewing was there. And of course, it kept damaging his hamstring. And when I talked to him about it, he's a big footballer, but he broke down and cried. And I bought his, got his father in and a psychologist in, and we talked through it. And really, it was all about that. And when we had worked all that out and they gave it, had a hug and you know, decided they could live appropriately, he went back and played another two years without a single injury to his hamstring. So in other words, I didn't treat his hamstring. I treated the cause of the hamstring injury, mm -hmm. which is, was his issue with his father. And in most cases of sports medicine, that's what you're really doing. You're dealing with their environmental situations and things like that, or internal situations of poor diet, et cetera, but still upsetting the apple cart. And that's why no matter what disease, uh, when a person walks in, in fact, it's quite a, a joke. When I, I do demonstration treatments, when I, I lecture and tour, and the idea is practitioners, I do a couple of days where practitioners bring in tough cases that they can't fix <laughs> for themselves, that they can't fix. And my job is to treat them. And the standard practice for me that I actually prefer is when the patient pops on the table, they don't tell me anything about themselves or what's wrong with them. I prefer not to know because I don't need to know. Mm -hmm. And they're a bit surprised, you know, and then when I go through my process, and I tune into the patient and I ask the questions. I can say, okay, you've got problems. You've got two kidney stones in, in the right kidney and you've got um, some minor stomach ulcers and you've also got diverticulitis in the lower bowel and so on. And I say, How did you know? Did my husband ring you or something? And I'm always accurate because their body told me. And then I do the appropriate linking. And what we do is we, we link the centers that need to communicate better either through the nervous system or the energy system or the blood system. And then a process of lightly tapping on the head and on the sternum and on the gut, we activate the neurological systems and all the circuitry to set about fixing that. It's like, okay, here's what's wrong. And the tapping says, go fix it. And that tapping is something I developed many years ago, but a lot of people are using it now. It's become a favorite thing, you know, the power of tapping, because when you tap, you get a 
you set up a wavelength that causes any form of subtle imbalance that you're aiming at and that you've got clear in your mind, it causes it to get the body to start balancing it. And then the body heals itself. And um, so from my perspective, in the old days in practice, it was traumatic. A lot of patients, a lot of decisions. I had to make life and death decisions as to what I'd do and what I wouldn't do, etc. That's one of the problems of being in practice. But since body talk, I've never made a decision about a patient because I just sit with the patient and I let their body tell me exactly what to do. And I don't make any decisions about it. I have to know what questions to ask. But beyond that, the body heals itself, which means I go home stress-free because I haven't had to make any decisions or worry about whether I make the right ones, which is a nice way to practice. Oh, I bet. And uh, so I've gone now probably 25 years without with treating still thousands of people, literally, uh, without ever having to decide what I'm going to do next, which is uh, a nice way. And, of course, the results are better. Once you impose your knowledge and will that you think your knowledge is, and I think if you've been in healthcare as long as I've been, you know that none of us know anything really much about the body. We're still learning. And I've been talking nonstop, so you better oh, come in I on me it. and tell me off or <laughs> <laughs> lead, lead me in a different direction. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. From what I'm understanding, body talk not only empowers the practitioner, but also empowers the patient empowers the client to um to listen to start listening and and get that there is a connection between emotion the mental body physical body energetic body spiritual body that 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 illness or an injury even an injury that you think is an accident well i i fell down i injured you know i injured that part of my body there's a connection it's a learning curve and most people who have been patients for a while or body talkers for a while start looking at things very very differently um, as to why everyone at the table can eat the same meal and yet two people get ill from it and others don't. And um, why when they go to an exotic, you know, Taiwanese restaurant, they can get ill. It's often not poisoning. It's just they're eating food that their body is not trained to genetically. And because they're eating a, a thing that their body is not trained to do it genetically, they're going to get reactions to it. And, um, you know, it is a case that whether we like it or not, our upbringing and our genes will determine a lot of what we can do and can't do in life. And so whether it's using our brain, using our body, you know, I was never in martial arts able to do a, a classic splits, you know, and a nice sidekick right to the top of the head um, because I'm, I'm Western <laughs> European and my legs don't part like that, no matter how hard I try. Whereas the little Chinese can do them immediately, you know, and you hate it. <laughs> so, um, our body is like that, and uh, even exercise. When people go to do exercise, I would see people being put on exercise. You know, the psoas is weak, and you know they've got to strengthen the psoas. So the psoas stretches, etc. Classical physical therapy, but find that they weren't responding. Well, they'd respond, but as soon as they played sport, they were back into trouble again. Then, of course, when they came to me, then we started looking at the psoas in a different way because the psoas. Actually, the energy of it is controlled by the kidney adrenal complex. And in fact, the problem was an adrenal exhaustion and weakness. And uh, then I, you could trace that through that the, the, the adrenal, the exhaustion of the adrenals is one of the most common things because it can be exhausted just through stress. But an exhausted adrenal creates stress. And in a typical case, a lot of people with low back problems will get. Uh, exhaustion of the adrenals because between L2 and L3 vertebrae, between the spinous processes, there's an acupuncture point called, called uh, governing vessel 4, and to the side, two more points, bladder 23, but they're right on the major governing vessel meridian and the Kundalini energy, and people don't know that they have, or a lot of people don't know, unless they're traditional acupuncturists, those points have internal links directly going to the kidney adrenal complex and to the lower Dantian, which is just below the navel. And they are meant to strengthen it. Now, when the people do end up with a, a low back problem, although it may not be hurting them that much, if they have that problem between L2 and L3, it inhibits the, the energy flow to the adrenals and exhausts them. And um, hence, although it's an adrenal problem and therefore maybe heart problems, digestive problems, adrenals can cause anything. But in fact, the treatment, the best treatment is to free up the second and third lumbar vertebrae 
and to open up those points to get the energy to flow, which we have techniques for doing. And uh, again, it can be very surprising where you, I've treated people for migraines with because of ingrown toenail. Now, that's not the only reason why you treat migraine, but the thing is, I don't categorize things I did with migraine. I used to have them myself. I wrote a thesis on migraine, and there are 72 different types of migraine and uh, with different etiologies and different backgrounds. And one of the problems in treating it, if you don't have an understanding that uh, there's no such thing as a common migraine, and you do have an understanding of the mechanics, then you know what questions to ask. And when you do, you'll find that many of the migraines are caused by their diet, others are caused by their a mechanical problem of the neck, other times it's skull issues uh, from concussion or something like that. Many are from liver problems and gallbladder problems and so on. Now, people talk about a migraine, but in fact, if you put them into 72 categories, there's 72 different diseases. Mm -hmm. And um, again, my students don't have to learn all those. I, I learn them because I developed it, but it's a case if you're aware of that, you're not going in blind and saying, oh, the migraine is an eating problem, you know, um, or, or, or so on. You're going to be open to say, okay, no, this one's got nothing to do with that. This migraine is because they've got displaced coccyx. They've come down on their coccyx and displaced it. It's tucked under a bit. That's affected the governing vessel meridian right up to the spine into the head. And it's been a major catalyst for their migraine. And you correct the coccyx and everything changes. How do you determine what one of 72, are, they, are you listening as a medical intuitive to the body or your practitioners? How do your practitioners determine what is the root cause of the migraine? A bit of both. I'm, I'm pretty well educated. I've never stopped studying all my life. I think if you're in healthcare, it would be fraudulent to practice in healthcare if you didn't continue your studies and improve your knowledge because we know so little. Um, but yeah, right from the very early, the Mindscape, basically, when I developed that, it was, that was in my late teens, and I developed it for my martial arts because I wanted an intuitive understanding of what was going on. So I was cheating a bit because when I was across from somebody, I knew what they were going to do, you know, a second before they did it. I could tell intuitively, which meant I was always prepared. <laughs> I was blocking their punch before they even threw it, the type of thing, you know. And... Um, the fact is, I then converted into medical intuition, and that's where I was doing it with those doctors and that, because I was tested to ensure my medical intuition is accurate. And it is accurate. If someone's got a kidney stone, I can tell you what size it is and how many there are, etc. And the Mindscape and parts of our course do teach us that, that although you may not be very good at it, if you use that plus the basic intuition of the body by getting biofeedback from the body, bit like you do in kinesiology and other courses, and your mind's a little bit more specific in the questioning, then um, you can ascertain a great deal. Uh, the key is to know the questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And that's what you learn when you study the body talk system. You, you learn the dynamics of the body, how it functions, then the types of qu the questions you've got to ask and how to know to determine that. And then you have to have a better idea of all the different factors that affect healthcare uh, and affect disease because uh, you know I used to specialize in sports medicine but at least 70% of my sports medicine on elite athletes I think I'm talking Olympic athletes and you know country representatives 70% of them had nothing to do with their injuries they were all to do with either their emotional life at the time or sometimes their diet and, uh, you know, other pastoral things, but very often emotional factors. Uh, you have no idea what it's like to train to the Olympics and then miss out at the very last moment, not be able to go. It's devastating. And they've got to come back from that and then try again. And uh, this getting to work with them and understand that, you make a huge difference mm -hmm. because very often they don't do well in athletics because of that emotional curtain. Mm -hmm. they, they're psyched out. You know, that's a big problem with uh, sports. Well, using Mindscape, they can actually, they actually stop doing that. And in fact, the Mindscape technique I developed way back then is now used throughout the world. If you actually watch the Olympics and everything, you'll see a you know, guy go out to do the pole vote and you see him going through it with, in his mind. 
or a high jump. They're doing it in their mind. They're doing the sprint in their mind. They're actually running and doing it and seeing themselves achieve it. That is a technique of mindscape that you can apply in many different things, but it's now being applied. I think Bon Borg was one of the first to apply it. And um, he didn't have that great a technique, but what he saw was a big ball and a racket, and the racket had to hit the ball there. And he let his subconscious mind take over from there. And he was one of the first ambassadors of what they call the inner game of tennis, which is a sub-branch of Mindscape. And um, our body, you know, we're all intuitive. It's just a matter of learning how to do, learning the, the pros and cons of how to do it. And uh, I know in my Mindscape technique, which, uh, which I've been teaching for a long, long time, I taught my first courses in the uh, early 70s. Um, and now I still have Mindscape instructors all over the world. The, uh, as you, when you develop it, it just opens up a whole new paradigm of how you see things because the, the intuitive and intuition can be very strong. But of course, when they're training, they have to, they have to prove it. You have to, you know, I won't let you go out and use it unless you verify. And, um, when I say verify, one of the easiest ways is I have a student there on their second day of the course and we do a little exercise and I'll grab someone out of the audience and draw them out of a hat. I don't care who it is. It can be the most unlikely person who looks the furthest thing from intuitive and bring him out and he goes into what we call the workshop and sets it up. And I have a bit of paper in with me and I unfold it and it's got the name and uh, death, birth date and country a person lives in. That's it. And uh, using that material, those people in their workshop can bring in, we'd call it their energy blueprint, and then start telling me in detail what's wrong with them. And what would happen is in the envelope, you know, there's, oh, he's got a missing finger here and he's got that and he's had a, a kidney operation and so on. And when I finished, they said, that was all bullshit, wasn't it? I said, okay, we'll have a look. And I opened up the envelope and they read it and it was exact, they're exactly right. And that's a pretty strong emotion for people to feel. Well, they may not be exactly right. They may only be 60% right. But 60% right and when you think of all the things that can go wrong is dramatic. And as I point out, once they've done it about 15 times, they should be 99% right. So that's an aspect that come in before body talk, but it's certainly something that we work with body talk with because it helps us to have that deeper intuitive understanding of what's going on and what's happening. And that's an ongoing process. I love and then it. the other ongoing process is just more and more advanced types of concepts for tougher and tougher diseases. I love that you're you're addressing that we have that innate um, ability to connect, connect with each other, connect with our bodies and listen. And that that um, there's so much more than just seeing. I, I think uh, so many people just believe only what is in the physical. But when you start using things like acupuncture and we're working with energy that's flowing through the body and uh, you have to get like with homeopathy, which is energetic medicine and acupuncture, we're, you know, there's so much more to our world. We can't see it. And so, you know, people write it off, but it's real. We have that ability and it's, it's amazing yeah. when we tap into it. I know that like as parents, we definitely like I, um, my husband and I both experience it. We, when our son was younger, we would know when he was about, like he'd be asleep in his room and we'd know when he's about to cry. Like we both jump up and walk towards the room and then he'd start crying like we just knew it and very often it's having young children that we learn that <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a um, shame because a lot of people don't realize their potential and their capabilities i mean we take mindscape a lot further than that and um it is yeah it's a very it's very powerful working with energy and you you can quickly learn that there's so much more to energy than we realize and how much powerful it is I used to demonstrate and I still talk about even things like martial arts. Right? Back in the old days when I was demonstrating, we had uh, clay roofing tiles. Right? And um, by way of demonstration back in those days, you expected if you're a karate expert to be able to break a few things. Although most of karate isn't like that. It's like typically it's more a philosophy and a way of life. But they'd, if they put a stack of tiles there, say 20 tiles, and I'd stand over the top of them and punch straight into them. And I used all my power, as far as all my technique and strength, I may break the top 10. And then what I'd do is I'd put tiles back and then I'd go into Mindscape and just go into my center self 
and my energy vortex below my navel where the chi starts, build the chi up so that it can flow through my body. And then without much speed and with no real effort from my body, just bring my fist down with the chi in the fist projecting into the tiles. And when I hit them, they would explode. Mm -hmm. All the tiles would explode. And the biggest piece was like, you know, a, 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 a coin. Uh, because when the energy hit with less speed and power, uh, it exploded the tiles. And when people see that, they realize there's a lot to do with energy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it, it does it. That's where, if you're a top martial artist, you don't use power. You know, like the NBA guys just keep hitting each other with just the power of their arm moving. But if you're properly trained in martial arts and you know a tree, there's, there's never going to be more than one punch in a fight. Mm. If I hit somebody, they don't get up. You know, mm. because I use chi, um, but I don't compete. <laughs> yeah, back then, I my comp competition days were in my teens. But again, using I was using Mindscape because I developed it, and I was never defeated for uh, 15 years. And uh, which was unusual to me because I was glad because uh, they lasted quickly. I never liked hurting people, but it was a sport. We really didn't hurt each other that much, and. Uh, Besides which, if I did, I could get them down and I'd fix them up. Quick smart. <laughs> <laughs> you reminded me, um, one of your stories jogged a memory. My husband um, should should have a pacemaker. He's a candidate mm -hmm. for a pacemaker. He's had acute AFib more than three times. And uh, going the cardiologist route, they wanted to go that direction. You know, put him on medication and then put him on uh, basically... Uh, put him on a pacemaker. And luckily, we um, were at the time starting to explore natural medicine and diving deep into that. And it was an old school nature path that said, there's nothing wrong with your heart. You have an impingement in your thoracic spine. That's uh, the one of the nerves that innervates the heart is misfiring because you have this impingement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so sure enough, he was in acute AFib, you know, diagnosed acute AFib. His heart was, all four chambers were spasming. He would, you know, blue lips, problems breathing, like told really, really bad. And we, uh, you know, got his back adjusted and, and uh, he took uh, contrast showers, hot and cold and put ice on his back and r bed rest. And mm -hmm. it, and it just went away, it just completely, mm -hmm. the, the heart corrected itself. And that's when... Um, that was a big aha moment for me because if we went hundred percent, the allopathic medical field, they would have, um, seared his heart, uh, and put a pacemaker in and, and just, I'm imagining how many people are diagnosed incorrectly, but it's to, to the allopathic field. It is the correct diagnosis. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes it's the only way of treating it too. Right, right. There's so many more ways of treating it from what you've said, for example, migraines, there are over 70 causes of migraines. And uh, uh, going allopathic medicine, it's well, here's another drug, try another drug, try another drug, try another drug. Yeah. And there's so many more, there's so many ways of actually approaching it, because the root cause is somewhere else outside of their um, training. Yeah, well, there's two things in that. Um, you know, when I did the certain all the the stages of migraine that was back when I was using things like Chinese medicine and that so therefore I needed those as diagnosis right nowadays if someone came with a migraine I wouldn't try and work out what type they have I just do what the body tells me to do right? mm -hmm. and um, with the heart um, actually I have found the two or organs easiest that you can get by far the best results with when they're seriously ill are the liver and the heart the liver's got a great thing going for it because it replaces itself completely every month Right, mm. all the cells are replaced. So therefore, if it's got a repair from something, you know that it's going to grow new tissue. If, and provided you set up the right conditions, it'll grow good, healthy tissue within a month. And um, then it's like what I did. I had ninety percent of my liver gone, and I got it to grow back within a month, uh, fully. Not using body talk in those days, but using energy medicine. And um, the heart, I think, in the last three years, keeping tab. When I travel around the world and lecture, I do, after I do a three or four days lecture, I then do a couple of days of demonstrating treatment. And usually it's people who book in, who have had a lot of treatment, not getting results, or it's practitioners bringing their tough cases they're not getting results with. And then I treat them, because so they're all the tough cases, which I enjoy. And the interesting thing is, the basic rule I have 
it's not a rule, but I suggest that when they have on the table, they don't tell me anything that's wrong with them. And I'll tell them because, you know, people tell you a lot of bullshit, basically, because they, you know, they have a pain here and they think that's everything they've got to worry about. But the pain is coming from somewhere completely different. But over that time, I've had nine people who were on a waiting list for heart transplants. And one of them was for heart and lung transplant. And, um, oh, no, 10. But of those, nine of them got completely better within two months, verified by the cardiologist. And um, that shows what the heart can do. You know, it can repair dramatically. And, uh, you I know, sometimes heart attacks, yeah, I've had a heart attack. I had one last year. But it was basically a genetic d disorder because I, I don't have high cholesterol or anything like that. But I got a kink in my ventricular artery and I got a blockage there, of blood clot. But the rest of my heart was clear. But it was dangerous. And uh, by the time the surgeon got in there and put the tubes up there and, you know, pulled the blood clot out, he said I was probably about five minutes from death. And um, but when he pulled it out, I felt a million dollars. And uh, they put me on all the heart medicine, blood thinners and everything. But, you know, I worked on myself. And now my cardiologist is sort of saying, you know, we're going to take you off all your heart medicine. You don't need it. Because <laughs> I was originally told I'd need it for the rest of my life. But they've done echo chambers, everything, and my heart's in perfect condition again. Mm. So mind you, it wasn't seriously on the first place. That was a freakish block. But it was unpleasant at the time, that's for sure. Now, the body is capable of healing, for sure. Because you're a student and you're always learning, what did you learn from your heart attack? Uh, well, for a start... I'm a great practitioner, but I'm a lousy patient. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take advice. I've always thought of myself as indestructible. You know, when you've been doing martial arts since you're seven years of age, and although I stopped when I was, you know, heavy in practice, I've always had great physical attributes as far as um, sports and energy, etc. And um, I've had virtually, I've had a couple of, serious illnesses, but I'd never get normal things. In 16 years of practice, I never took a day off. I never get hard colds or flu or anything like that. Um, and the disorders I've had, interesting, that really got me into healthcare, uh, genetic. I have a couple of genetic disorders. One of them was that one in the heart, and I have a, another called McArdle's disease, which is a rare disease where you're missing enzymes, so you can't break down glycogen and, uh, sorry, glucose. So if you're doing exercise and you run over glucose in the blood, there's no more. So your legs go into cramp, which is not good in martial arts because I found that after a certain amount of training or competing, my body would go into spasms and I could have a hundred muscles cramping at the same time. Mm. And um, it's debilitating, terrible condition. But over the years, I've using body talk, I have controlled it. So I can do quite a lot of sport and things like that. I do have some limitations, but the, the degree I had it, most people are in a wheelchair by 45, 50. Mm. I'm about to, I'm turning, approaching 70 and I'm not, I'm able to do anything I want. Uh, but I still get cramping from that, from that. So my life has more been genetic type disorders. So that was pretty un unique as far as my situation goes. Mm -hmm. But I had enough illnesses to have to learn a lot to be able to fix them because they were unusual ones, you know. Earlier, you when you were talking about healing the heart and the liver being the sort of almost the easiest organs to heal, you said um, that we need to set up the right conditions. What are the right conditions for creating health, or is there are there any universals when it comes to setting up the right conditions? Yeah, I can't, but I can say these are the type of parameters. One of the major things that uh, is one of the courses I teach uh, is based on osteopathic work and energy osteopathic, and that is. Uh, energy manipulation of organs and things like that to get them in a position. Because if you've got the focus, right, um, if someone's got a hiatus hernia syndrome and the stomach, you know, sticking very high and poking, the stomach's poking through in, in, up through the diaphragm, I can, without touching the person or just putting a hand lightly on the skin, pull that stomach back into position, right? If the kidney's dropped right down and it's sitting on the pelvis, you can pull it up and put it back in position. And you can do that with focus, just focus and energy. And it's one of the things I teach. Now, with people with heart, you know, heart lung conditions, they always go together. They're so closely related that if you've got a heart condition, you've got a lung condition and vice versa. And the thing is, if we just look at the lungs, 
the lungs are porous and they're meant to expand and contract. But because of falls who have had, blows, twists, awkward lifts, the lungs can change position. They have certain flexibility and they can change position. But if they only change a small amount and they talk a bit, this greatly reduces the ability of the lungs to expand. And um, therefore oxygenation to occur and getting rid of the carbon dioxide. And um, plus they have in inhibited, you know, they, they know it. One lung doesn't come out like the other. And um, what I do with that, I used to, I use a respirometer and test their lung capacity, you know, and they go blow it in it and it registers 100 when it should be 200 to 300. But after I correct their lungs, I immediately set them up and do the respirometer and again, and they've gone from 100 to 400 above average. And they can breathe. Oh, I can breathe again. Now, when you've got that, and those lungs are feeding the heart, they're putting a burden on the heart. The heart has to pound harder to just get enough oxygenation occurring, as it were. So what happens is people with chronic lung disorders, like heavy smokers and things like that, or from sport where their lungs are a bit twisted, it causes their heart to enlarge. That's why medically they say, like, people over 40, about 70% have an enlarged heart. That's because 70% of them have displaced lungs and heart. Because as soon as I put the lungs back in position and sometimes the heart, all that goes, the heart shrinks down a normal size and everything comes normal. Then the other side is the heart can actually get displaced again through stretching trauma and things like that. And it's not quite in the right position and it's talked, which means the, the valves don't work right. And you might get the valve flaps closing not together but you know dot dot so you, instead of lub dub you know, lub dub dub which is quite common and from a medical point of view it's just common nothing you can do about it but from my point of view it's not because that weakens the pumping action of the heart the ability to pump when the valves aren't shutting right so what i do is i go in and i hold the heart in my hands just intuitively talk the heart and oftentimes it's a millimeter sometimes it can be two or three millimeters but it just talks the relationships and then when you feel the pulse or listen to the pulse, there's no longer the lub dub dub, it's lub dub because the valves are shutting properly. And um, so there's so many different problems with the heart where it's because of mechanical distortion. Um, a great example of that is heart surgery doing that. And um, I think one of the ones I enjoyed most was a guy in Canada. And um, he had had surgery open heart surgery, quadruple bypass some four years earlier. And he was in agony because even after the straight after surgery, every breath hurt him really bad. He couldn't sleep at night. He had to have heavy sedation to be able to sleep at all. And every breath was extremely painful. And his body rocked there because his heart was beating so badly and so chaotically that his whole body would shake with it. He kept going back to med doctors and he said, look, it's in the wrong position. The heart's in the wrong position and there's lesions there holding it in the wrong position. In fact, the, per, the, the pericardium is attached to your sternum, but it, it happened from the surgery, but we can't go in again. It'll kill you. So all we can suggest is keep taking the, the painkillers we're giving you, which are oxycodone or something. And, uh, but that wasn't helping. So anyway, in class, so someone brought him in class and I treated him. And when I moved his heart, it actually hurt him because I, there were lesions. I had to tear the lesions away, tear the heart away from the, the sternum to get the heart into a better position. I wasn't moving it far, but only at probably three millimeters. But if you're clearing the lesions, then I had to put the heart, the, the, the lungs straight. And immediately we all saw this change in his breathing, dramatic change and freedom. He sort of burst into tears, wasn't sure. He was just amazed at what was going on. So I said, well, just relax at the moment, but can you come back tomorrow? I want to check. And he came back tomorrow, he waltzed in, jumped on the table, and said, that's the first full night's sleep I've had for four years. I have absolutely no discomfort or pain. Wow. And I also then asked him about a month later to go to his cardiologist and show him, and his cardiologist got rather annoyed. <laughs> yeah, that's impossible. That can't occur. <laughs> and... Um, because, and it wasn't against, you know, cardiologists, when I had my problem with the heart, I wanted a cardiologist, you know, I'm not saying that, but because they rely just on surgery and medicine, and they don't realize the body is a skeletal structure as well, 
and from the osteopathic background, which I have as well, structure governs function. And mm -hmm. a lot of the work we can do is it can be hands off. It's just energy but we actually reposition the parts of the body. We can even reposition the parts of the brain because sometimes the brain is malfunctioning because the relationship between the hypothalamus on one side and the other side is different, right? And they're distorted. And when you re realign them and you reconnect them and you know get the nervous system and blood system going with what we call body talk, getting the body to talk to itself, um, the changes are dramatic. Yeah, with body talk, our key is that the body's got to synchronize and it's got to, um, you know, you, you've got to worry about its coordination, that it coordinates well, that it synchronizes well, and it communicates well. Mm -hmm. And that's the three principles of body talk. And in order to do that, sometimes we've got to work on the nervous system or the energy system. Sometimes we work on the musculoskeletal system. And sometimes on the, the brains, uh, the, we work with three brains, of course. I think I listened to one of your talks to somebody else about that. You're aware of the three brains. Uh, medicine's only been aware of it fairly recently, but the Australian Aboriginals have been talking about the three brains for literally hundreds and maybe thousands of years. Mm. And, uh, you know, the brain in the head and the brain in the heart and the brain in the gut. I've been teaching it for a long time, but of course now it's become a very popular in medicine because they suddenly have discovered that there is a brain in the enteric brain that has very small nerve fibers, but it's very intricate, and it's actually a much bigger and more powerful brain than the brain in the head. Right? Mm -hmm. And the heart brain is more complex than the brain in the head. And they each have their job. And in our society, because we focus on the head brain, where it's doing jobs that the other two are supposed to do. You know, if you're deciding to, to get married or something like that, your your head brain's going to decide, yeah, you know, what's the best thing here? Uh, the important things, to, you know, is she wealthy? Does a father own a pub? Is she good looking? <laughs> is she good enough to be able to have a couple of kids and keep a figure, or et cetera? Yeah, you know, all the important things we Australians look at. And um, <laughs> you can make a decision. There. But the thing is, that's with the, the head brain. But in fact, for a proper decision, the head brain can analyze some of the issues, you know, as to social status and environment and things like that. But the heart brain is about relatedness. And it is the heart brain that if you activate that can tell you if you and her are going to get on and you have your know, like soulmates, as it were, that your heart's are going to be able to beat. And in fact, the Heart Institute has shown that when the hearts are in sync, Literally, they can measure the heartbeats and they actually synchronize with people and they actually affect other people if they they work together well. But you can that's where the heart brain comes in. And if it hasn't been working for a long time, of course, you make bad decisions. But even then, the final decision is the enteric brain. It sorts out the good from the bad regarding mm. food. It gets rid of all the toxins and keeps the good stuff. Uh, but it, it also differentiates everything. It is what makes a decision. Should I do this or should I do that? So the process of finding a partner is one, intellect, right? Looking at the pros and cons, etc. Number two, does it feel good? But ultimately, as in anything in life, the final decision has to be a gut decision. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, they've talked about this for centuries about making a gut decision. I'm going with the gut. Uh, even our highly popular and esteemed uh, President Donald Trump talks about it was a gut decision, so it was right. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to agree with his statement, but I don't think it <laughs> works that way with him. But um, I won't get into politics. The but the thing is, we've been I've been using the, the three brain concept for quite a long time because when you train the body and the, the brain system to work properly it means the right brains are doing the right things. And that's part of the body talk system to set that up so it can occur. And then you are making decisions with the gut, analyzing with the brain, head brain, and finding out if the job or the person or whatever is right for you. It's called relatedness, any relationship issues or relatedness. It can be even relatedness to your bank account. And if you're not in a good relationship with your bank account, you'll usually do stupid things. Go on a spending spree. Oh, look, I've got 
you know, my overdraft, I've got thirty, you know, ten thousand dollars left in it. So I've got ten thousand in the bank. They think what is what's still left on their credit card is actually money in the bank when it's not. It's just their credit limit. <laughs> and that's when they're coming from the brain, not from the, the gut. Mm. So that type of work, I mean, that's becoming big now. The the uh, three brains, and of course, the enteric brain is very involved with the microbiome. And I work with the microbiome a great deal. Uh, have been for many years, and um, it's now, of course, becoming far more complex than we realise. Uh, it was always amusing for me because when I was studying genetics, uh, it was always strange to me. One of my instructors, in fact, in Body Talk, um, Dr. Laura Sturve, um, besides being one of my instructors, she's a PhD in genetics, and she worked on the Human Genome Project, mm-hmm. uh, pretty high up in all that. And she was talking, you know, about the whole thing of uh, the, when they talked about the human genome, we only had 23 markers and, um, you know, distinct types. And yet when they did it with others, they found that the uh, a silkworm has about 28 and a moth has about 26. In other words, we, have, we are low on the scale in the number of genes we have, right? And yet we're supposed to be more evolved, which tends to tell us some different things about it isn't the number of genes you have, it's how they're put together and the, how they communicate, uh, which is something that's a major part of what we do is work with genetics and epigenetics uh, for genetic type diseases. But the whole point is, as far as complexity goes, if you actually look at it, any gene with DNA, etc., can influence a living thing provided it's in and within that living framework. Well, the number of cells in your body is about 100 trillion. The number of cells that have human genes is about 10, 10 trillion, which means 90% of the living cells in your body are not human cells. Mm-hmm. They're cells belonging to bugs, mm-hmm. <laughs> microbes, etc. But they all have DNA. Some have just have RNA, but they have DNA. So therefore, if you put together the DNA of those 90 trillion bugs and combine it with our human bugs, we're pretty well loaded with genes to work with. So the microbiome is actually a physical part of our body. And although they have smaller life expectancies, they are the most influential thing in the body. And we're learning that in the future. In fact, more and more, I do the body talk, we're doing more and more work just working with the three brains in the microbiome because they're the three things that aren't working well in the average person because they're the three things we've been ignoring in the medical field right. for way too long. Now microbiomes become flavor of the month and there's lots of research going on, uh, which is great because I was talking about it 10 years ago and it was like, well, what's that? You know, even the doctors. And the same as the three brain now has become pretty major. But um, I've been teaching them for a few years because intuitively I sort of worked these things out pretty early. And with Body Talk, it's really, we see all these things and to a certain extent, my own intuitive, you know, as a medical intuitive, I see things, then we just use the protocol. All we've got to do is we have to learn the protocol, we just dump them into the protocol. So once you've done, learned the basic protocols, when you learn, want to go to more Body Talk sessions, you basically you go to an area that you're interested in, mm-hmm. you know. It may be sports medicine, so you'll go to our advanced courses on sports medicine, or, or you know, it could be internal medicine, or it could be pediatrics or gynecology. I've uh, it's always a joke. Well, it's always a joke at the college is how many people I made pregnant, or women I made pregnant, because <laughs> I used to treat infertility sent to me by a gynecologist uh, with great results because they weren't looking at what was necessary to mm-hmm. be looked at. They always looked at it from a, either a chemical point of view or a mechanical point of view, which oftentimes they couldn't do anything about without surgery, and that would make things worse. Whereas if someone's got a badly retroverted uterus and their bladder's dropped or anything, techniques I've told you in the past, I can actually pull the uterus back into position, right? So it doesn't keep aborting the fetus and uh, bring up the bladder so you're not having to run to the toilet every two minutes when you're pregnant or when you get older. And um, there is so much can be done. But it's got to be in a systematic way. The you know out there, there's a lot of nice courses. You know, the there's a lot of one day courses you can do um, that have to do with neuralistic neurolinguistic programming and so on. And they all have 
something to that they have some value. They're easy to learn. People can use them on themselves and their family. We teach a course like that um, for personal assistance, uh, and they serve a purpose, but they don't serve the whole purpose. They only cover certain areas. Um, our, but at the same time, it's inv it's valuable. I have a, we have a course I put together quite a long time ago called it Body Talk Access, where the basic fundamental protocol for body talk, only about 10 different techniques that will balance out generally the body and help in basic first aid things. If little Johnny's coming down with a cold or the flu, you do this technique, they get better. If they've sprained their ankle, you do this technique, it heals much quicker and so on. It's basically for, for domestic first aid, etc. But it's only a one day course. And you can learn it in the day and you can go out and do it. You can't practice professionally with it, but it's great for use in the family or on yourself. And what it does is it keeps balancing out the brain. One of the techniques is what we call the cortices, which balances out the brain, which reduces stress levels and enables the brain to function better. And that makes a huge difference in children and their disposition and their problems of learning and so on. And in fact, that course, we, we really encourage it. As, as I said, it's not a professional course, but it's a course that we've taught, I think something like 15,000 people. And, um, we teach it all over the world, the, uh, and it can be incredible. And in fact, on people who have fairly simplistic health problems, such as indigenous people, uh, I have a foundation, the International Body Talk Foundation, which is not a 501c, and um, we get donations in so that we send people out into the Central Africa or India or the Philippines and everything, into areas of villages where they can't afford to have those courses, etc. So we pay the costs. And they teach the villagers you know, access, and they can do it in one day. They pick it up really quickly. And then that village can, because their diseases are a lot simpler, they're using it virtually as a medical system and only need to bring in doctors when it's really serious, like if Brian Ostras has stuck his horn through your ear. <laughs> um, then you'll need your medicine or you need more advanced body talkers. But that's proven really great. And we've gone into so many indigenous societies where – they're getting, they're supporting their whole community and, and they've reduced their need for doctors by about 20, sorry, by about 80%, which is great because they often, they have to walk for a day to get to a doctor. Mm. So it's exciting. And by the way, when people say, you know, how do they know whether it's really working or whether it's mine things, my experience is that uh, body talk works better on animals than it does on humans because, uh, a, it, it works well, but B, humans have far more psychological conditions and stress conditions and reasons for not getting better, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've treated many an animal that's sort of dying, basically, yet they're all young because they've got a very bad heartworm or something, and I've treated them, and they, get, they respond so quickly. They can get better before they walk out the door sometimes. So that's why uh, animal talk is rather popular, because we do have advanced animal talk, you know, using the whole system. And at the moment, I think there's three, three, two at the moment, and about to be a third in Southeast Asia, where we've had a big impact, where the veterinary schools have, have used, are using my course as part of their curriculum now. Wow. Because it gets fantastic results on so many conditions with animals. And with our wild animals, you don't have to actually touch them. You can treat them through a fence or whether at a, at a distance because it's energy medicine. And um, I, I get jealous because, you know, I could have had my choice, I would have been a vet rather than treating humans. <laughs> um, they're much easier to work with. <laughs> but I veterinary bet. science was, you know, in those days, was the hardest course in Australia to get into. You had to be in the upper one percent percentile, where medicine was two percentile. And but I ended up going for chiropractic, which was even easier, although I was two percentile. Um, but our veterinary work, the fact that it worked so well on animals. And by the way, I have plant talk and plant talk is really quite extraordinary. We get, we've had uh, whole areas where the forests are dying, et cetera. And we've used it as what we call plant earth talk, where we treat that forest and the plants and the communication between them because they, the average trees have 10 different systems of the communication. We have far less than that as human beings. And if you use their communication systems using the body talk protocol and connect them all up and get their communications going in a forest, you revitalize the forest. 
and revitalize the tree and all your veggies will grow much quicker and much better. And in fact, uh, plant talk is one of our huge courses along with animal talk. Because uh, a lot of body talkers are like me, they rather treat it's always a joke with uh, people say with me that if there was a car accident and there was a, a man and his dog lying in the middle of the road, I'd go and treat the dog first. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that. I probably wouldn't. I'd probably have a look at the man, get slip him an aspirin while I look at the dog. But um, the uh, yeah, so it's not body talk isn't a sort of little it thing. It is a very big uh, project. If you wanted to study it. The way it's going now, you can get your little things like a bunch of, sorry, the, the one day course in a day. There's uh, another course that enables you to practice virtually professionally, particularly if you've got a, other professional professions where you can le learn that in a few weekends. But the full professional course, I think it's about 18 different courses I've written. Uh, it Doing them, even doing them on weekends and everything, the study for exams and everything would take you probably about three years to get through. And then the advanced level would take you a couple more years. Uh, not because you're going full time, that you're doing them in, in the form of um, online courses. We have a lot online that can be done online. And then I have uh, 300 instructors teaching the stuff that actually needs to be taught live. And we're teaching them all over the world. So you've just got to add up all your courses and pass the exams on them. And then you can graduate at whatever level you want. Uh, like I said, Body Talk Access is really about, we teach it in schools, we teach it in uh, indigenous tribes, etc. They help each other a great deal. Very excited kids in the school, teacher goes over and does access on them. They settle down, they're a different person. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. This concludes part one. Please join us for part two as Dr. John dives into some wonderful stories about healing, human and animal healing, and shares more about his techniques, body talk, and the different courses that you can take to learn these techniques, which I find absolutely fascinating. It's been such a pleasure sharing this information with you. Please continue to share these podcasts with your friends and family so we can spread this information of holistic health. Enjoy part two. It'll be published soon. Thank you for listening. <laughs>